It's my honour to be invited uh, to speak to this special session of Thinkers Forum. Thinkers Forum is one of my favourite events in China and uh, unfortunately uh, I very much miss being there rather than here and I am again here but I hope soon I will be there with you. Modernization has for long been a critical concept in China's development. Its origins lie in China's failure to industrialise at the same time as Britain, which, as other European countries followed in Britain's tracks, was to leave China historically stranded, backward, vulnerable and poverty-stricken. As a result, China embarked on industrialization, or, to use a related term with a broader meaning, modernization, well over 150 years later than Britain. The great task facing China after 1949 was modernization, with the bar set by the West. It meant that China had no alternative but to adopt, broadly speaking, the Western paradigm for modernization. After 1978, China relentlessly pursued the task of modernization, with the United States proving to be the main influence. In important respects, nevertheless, the Chinese model was to remain distinctive. How could it not have been? China, as a latecomer, competing with Western countries that were much further down the road, had to make things up as it went along. However much it borrowed, it still had to invent its own path based on its very different history and culture. Chinese modernization was a hybrid, part Western and part indigenous. But China is now in a very different position. It is still primarily a developing country, but the most advanced parts of the economy are more or less on a par with Silicon Valley. The 20th Congress set the goal of China reaching the same level of development as middle-ranking European countries by 2035. What will this mean? Well, some parts of the Chinese economy will be well in advance of these European countries by 2035, and some will lag behind. The reason is that China is a continent, and transforming a continent is a very uneven process. We are already very familiar with this. In some sectors, such as mobile technology, artificial intelligence, and electric vehicles, China is already very advanced, on a par with, or even ahead of the United States with much of this progress being made in the last decade. Over the next decade or so, we'll, we will see far more of such progress, including in high-end semiconductors, a crucial area in which China is still some way behind the global leaders. The big takeaway here is that in a growing number of sectors, China will, by 2035, have, have arrived at the leading edge of modernity. Modernity, so long a creature of the West, increasingly no longer belongs to the West. We often tend to think of modernity in economic and technological terms, but it is much broader than this. The whole of society, at varying speeds, is ultimately transformed by the process of modernization and reaching modernity. Take the example of common prosperity. Western-style globalisation led to growing inequality in many countries, with China no exception. China's Gini, Gini coefficient is more or less the same as America. Such a high level of inequality cannot be acceptable to a socialist country. Under the aegis of common prosperity, a debate is underway on how to reduce inequality in its multitude of forms. There is 
a similar debate in the West, but very little has actually been done. Inequality has continued to grow apace. Inequality is one of the great questions of our time. If China can find a way of successfully addressing inequality in the way it has conquered extreme poverty, such a fairer and more inclusive modernity will have an enormous global impact. One of the most important features of common prosperity is that far from seeing inequality in a narrow way, government interventions have included antitrust regulation and data security to protect the individual and empower consumers in their relationship with big tech in particular. The United States and China both faced the problem of the overbearing power of big tech. The difference is that China has introduced major new measures, while the United States, despite much talk, has done pretty much nothing. Or take another example, COVID-19. China and the West tackled it in very different ways with very different outcomes. China drew on its Confucian and communist traditions of social cohesion, combined with an extensive use of digital technology plus vaccination, while the West has relied very heavily on vaccination. China's results have been far superior, with many less deaths and infections. Their divergent, their divergent responses reflected deep cultural and civilizational differences. I will return to this theme shortly. A new kind of Chinese modernization depends on a new kind of balance in the relationship between Western and Chinese influences. China should place greater stress on its own intellectual and cultural capacity and become less dependent on American input and influence. How is this to be achieved? There is a powerful emphasis in Xi Jinping's speech on the importance of producing many more Chinese experts in the fields of science and technology as a way of promoting Chinese-style modernization. Likewise, he stresses the need for a great expansion of the Chinese university sector. But what kind of Chinese universities? There has been a strong tendency to ape American universities, to regard them as a template for what Chinese universities should be like. Certainly, China can and should learn a great deal from the best American universities. But Chinese-style modernization also requires different kinds of universities, different kinds of experts and ways of thinking. The same applies to academic disciplines. Academic economics in China, for example, has tended to pay too much respect and been too influenced by the economics discipline in the United States. The title of the concluding chapter of the first part of my book, When China Rules the World, published now 13 years ago, was Contested Modernity. This is exactly the territory we have now entered. It has been made possible by China's recent economic and technological progress. Previously, for the sake of argument, let's say until 2010, it was largely an unequal contest between Western modernity and China's partial modernity. This is still the case. But in the last decade, China's partial modernity has become less partial. And by 2035, we will, we will be much closer in the context of contested modernity so as to a situation of parity between China and the US. We should always remember, however, that China and America are different in countless ways apart from their different levels of development. China, for example, has four times the population of the US. China is thousands of years old, the US just a few centuries. 
centuries. Most importantly, China is a civilization state and the US a nation state. Their histories and their cultures, in other words, are profoundly different. Always have been and always will be. For these reasons, America and China will always be very different and it follows, therefore, that the nature and character of their modernities will always be very different. But the fact that by 2035, and even more by 2047, they will be at similar levels of development means that they will be more comparable than they have ever been before. Broad parity in their levels of development will make comparisons between them more relevant and political arguments between them more meaningful. But there will still be a chasm of difference stemming from their different histories and cultures. Such civilizational differences will always stand in the way of easy comparison. These differences should always be respected and honoured. The world would be an infinitely duller place without them. Chinese modernization is an enormous intellectual challenge. A new kind of modernity requires new ways of thinking and great self-confidence. Modernization 1.0, let's call it, must progressively be replaced by modernization 2.0. China Chinese modernization will still be and must be a hybrid because China must always learn from and be enriched by other countries. But the Chinese component will be greatly enhanced and Western influence will become more limited. Thank you very much for listening to me and have a very successful forum. Thank you. Bye-bye.